Good evening. Welcome back to the Henry Holster Shop. It is Wednesday evening. This is another episode of Holster Life, episode 33. And tonight we're talking about tempo. I have a cup of tea to eat, and I've got a tool tip, and I've got some swag to give away. And I actually took notes tonight. I even have notes to make sure I don't forget any of the important things I was planning to say. So, starting with the tool tip. Hello, Dan Taylor. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, earlier today, I did some Instagram live video. Hey, Skyler. And I was talking about this bad boy. Now, this is a, this is a 12 volt uh, Hitachi lithium driver that I love and use all the time. Hello, Tommy. Uh, but this is an Irwin Unibit, and I use this guy any time I have to slightly enlarge or ream out a hole. Hello, Dean Kennedy, Commonwealth Kydex up in her. Um, Dan Taylor, I think I get you confused. I think I get you and Skylar Gibbler confused, not because your names are similar, but for some reason I get... Miniman Defense and Commonwealth Kydex mixed up. I don't know why. So if I've called you Skyler, I apologize. Hello, Greg Swanson. So this is the slender taper unit bit. There are wider ones that have larger step outs, which are great if you're doing sheet metal work and need to make big holes. But this works really, really well and is controllable and predictable and does not pull through in the way that a standard drill bit would. If you ever tried to drill an existing hole with a bit that's slightly larger than the hole, two things the bit won't center properly, and it will tend to pull through and chew up your hole. So this, because it doesn't have a spiral, it's a straight taper, does not pull through. So you can control and shave, and you can also you know, punch one step and then maybe go a little bit more. You, yeah, you can also put this um, in any hand driver and use it. I like to do it. Um, I can put it in a drill, but I actually prefer to put it in the driver because it runs faster. But I'm usually doing, you know, just a quick, and that's it. The hole's done at that point. It looks sideways tonight. This is the normal setup, Todd May. It's like this every time. Not sure what's changed on your end. Try, try lying on your side. Um, so if you're doing uh, inside the waistband fold-over taco-style holsters that have non-adjustable retention, and you have eyelets below the trigger guard, when you fold up, if your alignment is slightly off, either you, if you pre-drill the holes, if you have pin markers in your mold and you pre-drill your holes and you fold up and the holes don't quite line up, sometimes you can force the eyelets through anyway, but you're gonna slightly torque or misalign the two parts of the shell, which could cause fitment issues, um, isn't generally a good idea if you can avoid it. So you can oversize one side of hole slightly so you have a little more wiggle room to line up your eyelets through. Generally, eyelets should press smoothly through two layers. If you're having to fight them through, then your hole is probably not clean or it's not aligned properly. Hello, Mike. Hello, Eric Claro. Um, so, if you need to slightly enlarge a hole, this is a great controllable way to do it. I keep one of these by my drill press. I have other ones, but this is my favorite one, the Slender Taper one. I use it fairly often. Um, so an example would be like a holster shell like this, Glock 43 eyelets here. I went ahead and reamed one of those so I could make little adjustments uh, with the live gun in place to make sure everything lined up the way I wanted, then set the eyelets and test. It's a prototype for a mold I'm doing. Um, so yeah, Irwin Unibit. Awesome stuff. I love mine and use it all the time. Uh, Swag and giveaway. So first of all, I know a lot of you have already been posting your company names up, but if you would like to enter for the giveaway this evening, you have to share the feed. So please share the feed, and I'm giving away one of my big stickers, and also another one of the Morpheus Solo Trays. So this beautiful guy, machined out of billet 6061. I will give away to somebody who shares the feed. So if you want to be entered into the giveaway for either the sticker or the tray, share the feed. 
So, on to tonight's discussion, since I didn't have any other tool tip to go over. Tempo. Share it, says Greg Swanson. That's what I like to see. Tempo. Um, I come from a music background. Some of you are probably familiar also with tempo from an athletics or sports background. Uh, I came to it through music and chess. And it's a little different uh, in chess. We won't get into chess tonight. The Morpheus rocks. I got mine. I like it a lot. I like, uh, and I quit smoking, says Conrad. Hey, Chris Williamson. Hello, Vern. Hits you right in the stogie. Well, here's your chance to get one for free, Skylar. All it costs you is a share. Um, I'm going to talk about tempo in two different contexts. Uh, I don't have any plans to emboss the holster. I'm looking at another option, Scott. But we'll see. I'm working on branding them. Um, I have an ink stamp that I use, but most of the time I've trimmed my holsters down to such a minimal size, there's not really a lot of flat area to throw my ink stamp on. So uh, I'm going to talk about tempo in two different contexts. One is a micro level, which is in the business, in production, in process. How does tempo affect your workflow, how you organize and batch your work, how you organize your schedule for the day, when you do your work, how much of the time you do, how you pace yourself. Uh, it also connects then to what you promise to your customers, how you handle shipping and delivery. All those things are affected by the tempo of your shop. And then second, in the larger, more macro sense, um, tempo in terms of the pace your business develops and grows at. Uh, what's the pace you're moving at toward the goal of expansion or growth? And that can factor into things like when you hire, when you move to a bigger shop, when you release new products, when you add new models, when you take on new distributors and gun stores, when you revamp the website, when you start your first website. All those things are wrapped up in the tempo at which your business moves and grows. So. First, first macro thesis. For a business, the ability to move at speed is always a benefit. A half inch diameter would look cool. Yeah, I've got, I've got one that's a little bit larger than that. I should get a smaller one and just stamp it on there. Thanks for the push, Scott. I'll get on that. That's a, that's a faster and quicker solution that I can execute on much more uh, in much less time. I have a cool solution I'm working on, but it's months away. Um, on a macro level, I lost my train of thought for a second. I was talking about, oh, the ability for a business to move at speed is always a benefit. No business is ever at an advantage because they can't move fast. And so if your business is small and agile, that is an advantage you have Whereas on the flip side, companies that have a lot of inventory, a lot of space, a lot of equipment, a lot of capital, a lot of employees have, they've realized advantages in efficiency of production, economy of scale, but the trade-off for that is the business ceases to be nimble. Small parts of the business may be nimble. They may have an ACE R&D department. They may have some machinists and guys who are prototyping, who are top-notch, who move at incredible speed. But the business as a whole, its shipping, its distribution, its, its inventory, all those things can't happen super quickly. Jeff and Sean are watching from LAS Concealment. Hello, Nick Hoffer from Hoftac. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm giving away a big sticker and also a Morpheus solo tray. So if you want to be entered into for the drawing for those, you have to share the feed tonight. Tonight we're going for bigger numbers than usual. It's been a while since I've done a giveaway on here, it feels like. Um, so if you're small and agile, that gives you the ability to work at a wider range of tempos. And there are trade-offs. I've said this in many videos, I'll say it again. In business, we're always making trade-offs. Everything we pursue comes at the cost of something else. Everything you say yes to involves you saying no to other alternatives. Saying yes to wholesale and going full bore into production of a narrow product line and trying to choose to you know, pursue distribution and pump out tons of product means saying 
no to one-off, walk-in, full custom, any color, small of the back, cross draw, right or left hand, deep conceal, high ride, any of that jazz. And so we're always trading off. When you're dealing with tempo, here are some of the trade-offs as I think about them in my shop. So the first one is um, I'm always trading um, well, one way to say it is I'm trading speed for comfort because a hustle pace is usually not especially comfortable. I'm trading familiarity for uncertainty. I am exchanging predictability for a certain constant level of chaos. That can be that my product line is in flux because I'm aggressively trying to improve it. It can mean that I'm constantly tweaking the website. It can mean a whole bunch of things that could move at a slower pace and be more stable and more predictable are instead being agitated. That things are not settled. I like to get in a groove and when it comes to my micro work in the shop, whether that's working on molds, making shells, packing product, printing lots of labels and shipping a bunch of stuff. Hello Maureen, I like to get into a groove, which is one of the reasons why lately you've seen less of me during the day on social media, although I'm trying to still post some things from time to time. Mrs. Go Hard Holsters here. Hello Mrs. Go Hard Holsters, I sent your husband his cool sticker that he won on my Instagram live feed. It went out in the mail today. so. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm giving away some of the comfort um, of the grooves I like to get into. But I've been trying to groove harder, more intensely, and one of the main things that, that, that's meaning for me is that I'm turning my phone off for long stretches of time during the day. And so if you've been trying to get a hold of me, you've been trying to text or call or anything like that, and I don't answer you for hours, it's nothing personal. Although, for a few of you, it's completely personal. Um, it's usually not anything personal. It's usually because in order to put my head down and charge through some discrete block of work, I have to be distraction free. And it's enough work for me to manage my own work and the employee's full-time work now that I can't also be answering emails, taking phone calls, getting back to texts quickly without simply spending my time juggling and not accomplishing. So when it comes to speed in my shop, in my micro work level, it tends to be sprints rather than marathons. And that's a function of having somebody to manage, of doing different kinds of work. A lot of the prototyping and the mold development I work on involves changing gears often. I might make one copy of the mold, then pull two test shells, then make a trim fixture, then test some trims, then fold some things up, then put hardware on, then wear it around for a little bit, then take it off, then cut the holster apart, then check out the inside, check my tolerances, do all different kinds of things, and I keep changing gears throughout the day. Rarely do I have a full day of any one thing. And so for me to do that with speed, I have to put my head down and sprint for a period of time then stop, reset, change gears, do the next thing, get into it, sprint, and then keep changing gears. Um, another way for you, get, for you to get speed in your production is to have a moderately paced but smooth and efficient flow that runs without interruptions. So if you're the kind of guy who is working quietly out of your basement or one car garage and you're basically doing your own thing and you don't have a lot of customer service to deal with, you don't have a lot of people calling you or texting you, your website's not blowing up, this is not you, Jeff Kwan. But if you have the benefit of relative peace and quiet, you can cruise in a way that I currently can't in my shop. Um, and. I know this is a somewhat contentious phrase and I don't want to try to make it carry too much weight but okay, you guys have all heard slow is smooth, smooth is fast. On one level that's true. In reality fast is fast and going slow and getting things smooth is how you get them fast and then they go fast. 
Hello, Jefferson Brooks. Hello, Mike Hallam. I'm doing a giveaway, do, giving away a big sticker and also a Morpheus solo tray. But in order to be entered into the giveaway, you have to share the feed. So share the feed, and I'll go through at the end of the evening and pull all the names of people who shared the feed while the feed was live. It has to be a share while the feed is live. Um, so you can create speed by getting cruising through work or sprints with you know, gear changes and fits and starts. But if you move quickly, you can still get a lot done there. One of the trade-offs of speed that I'm always balancing, because there's a point at which you cross over into going too fast. We want to hustle. We don't want to rush. Because hustle is about intensity. Rush is about being beyond the boundary of where you can do good work. So I want to do good work, but I don't want to do work beyond the speed, beyond the range at which I can do the minimum quality of work that I need. So the two opposite extremes here are the person who rushes so much moves so fast that at the end they have quality control issues because there were inconsistencies in the process. It's spastic, it's frenetic, it can get disorganized. It feels like there's a ton of motion, but if you lose the consistency, especially if you're trying to do wholesale, volume, a lot of repetition, if you need consistency in the process, if it gets too spastic and that consistency suffers, then all the speed you gained by rushing, you lose at the end by having to go back and add steps, do extra QC, reject some units and lose the cost of that material and labor, or adjust units and be putting in labor you wouldn't have had to if you hadn't gone too fast early on. Hello, Matthew Bills. Thanks for watching. Hi, John DeFrancesco from Red Earth Concealment. Doing a giveaway, big sticker and amorphous solo tray. Share the feed to be entered. And also, if you're a Cactus company and you just joined and have not yet posted your company name, please post your company name. The tool tip tonight, I'll reiterate real quickly, was the Irwin, I can't find, oh, here we go. Irwin Unibit, great for deburring holes and slightly enlarging holes to line up eyelets that are slightly misaligned. Great for that. Irwin Unibit. So, the other, um, the other way that I think about working fast in my shop is the balance between stress and peace of mind. Hey, Tyler, can I show this holster? It's a hand cut. It's not a CNC trim. So the profile's not there, but uh, the cosmetic stuff is. And that, you guys can hear this? That is crispy. Hello, PJ. So this is a hand cut shell from a test mold I made for Tyler Connor today. It's got some neat uh, cosmetic cuts. This might look familiar. It's a little bit like the filster shape, but also a little bit different. Uh, this is a G43. It does have a wedge on it. This prototype didn't since we were just playing around with retention shapes. And listen to this click. Mm. One more time. Yeah, that's what I like. Um, the balance between stress and calm. I work best under a certain amount of pressure. It can be pressure I generate myself. It can be pressure that comes from having deadlines. I find that I am a creature that requires structure. I need to have some external boundaries and frame to work inside. I don't think outside the box very well. I like to have, I like to have a box and I like to innovate inside it within certain frameworks so that I have something to, I just have, I have a zone that I'm in. Um, for me, trying to work too fast starts producing an exponential curve of stress. At a certain point, the additional stress that the little bit of speed is producing completely negates the benefit for me. Because when I'm stressed, I don't think as clearly I make more mistakes. I'm more likely to give poor customer service because I'm snippy and on the edge. Um, it affects my home life when I come out of the shop. 
It can affect my relationship with my employee. It can make me less of an understanding, uh, helpful leader, boss in the shop, and more of a taskmaster. And so too much speed, too much pressing that pedal can, can produce diminishing returns by simply increasing the stress level. Um, I, I limit myself currently to two cups of coffee a day because if I have more than that, I start to get cranky. Um, just because, I don't know, I guess I'm a coffee lightweight. By the end of the evening, I'm just drinking tea. Uh, and it's herbal tea, not even any kind of black tea, nothing caffeinated. Um, but as you work in your own process, you will have to find, Jeff Kwan, finding balance. You took the word right out of my mouth. You'll have to find the balance that works for you, and then you'll constantly need to ride the front edge of it because this is kind of like I've never been a good baseball player. I can't hit a fastball for my life. But you guys have all heard the fastball analogy or the explanation of how pro-level major league batters seem to process an incoming pitch differently through thousands of repetitions. And, and this is true of uh, all kinds of very high-end athletics, that the person gains an ability to process familiar things so much more quickly that it's kind of like time slows down for them. Jefferson Brooks says, when you get stressed, take a moment to sit back and listen to that click as you work a holster. Yeah, like if I'm stressed, sometimes I'll just pick something up and... One more time. Deep breath, square breathing. I don't ever actually do that during, during the day in the shop. I've never done that before. But it's soothing. Maybe I should start. Maybe I should start selling fidget toys and special click holsters that are not designed for carry, and they're just designed to provide that soothing click. Um, but you know you better than I know you. You need to find out what works for you as a way to sort of punch the reset button and temporarily set aside the stress. Sometimes for me, one more time, one more time, Tyler, for you, and then I'm putting it away. Here's the click. Yeah. Um, find what works for you to punch that reset button. I find that often for me, taking a few minutes to reorganize or sweep or clean or just let my mind wander about some part of the shop. Like look around the shop and think, what else could I put in that spot? Is there any place that would make more sense for that tool to be? Not this one. This one's staying right where it is, not moving it. But almost everything else in the shop has a place where it lives that it ended up when I first got it. And things are getting moved around now. So I threw away several tote bins worth of stuff earlier today because I needed to clear up some space under a bench for other things. And that is, that is low stress work for me. Taking a few minutes and going through stuff in the shop, throwing some things out, cleaning, organizing, getting out the shop back, taking a break, cleaning out the mill. Those things help me get some traction back. If I start spinning my wheels, I need to do something else for a little while. That can feel like it comes at the cost of speed, but the the outcome of me trying to stay in that rut and just mash the accelerator harder and spin the wheels faster um, is unlikely to actually get me where I want to go any sooner and will certainly stress me out more on the way. But when you find a balance that's comfortable for you and you get in those hundreds or thousands of repetitions, you will start to be able to go consistently faster and you need to lean into that in your process. If I had to pre-cut 200 holsters and my employee had to pre-cut 200 holsters, I would absolutely smoke him on pre-cutting 200 holsters. And it's not because he's slow, but because I know exactly what I want it to look like. I know exactly where the cuts are going to go. I don't have to think. I don't have to guess. I just have to cut. 
and so I can just crank through them. Hello, Jay Fowler from Contingent Holsters. We're doing a giveaway tonight, Jay Fowler. I got a big sticker and a Morpheus solo tray. If you want to be entered in the drawing, you have to share the feed. Hello, Sean BRK. Thank you for stopping in. So when you get that level of proficiency, what we would call unconscious competency, you're able to do things correctly the first time without having to think about them. You're just able to do them. You can stand by the buffing wheel and the edges are coming out clean every time you are at the drill press, drilling parts, and you're not missing holes, you're not wandering off, you're not scrapping parts, you're just cranking, it's going. Always consciously try to push yourself a little bit. Don't stress yourself out, and when we're working around power tools, do not rush. Getting some holsters done a few minutes faster is not worth losing a finger. It's not worth chipping a tooth. It's not worth having you know something get bounced off the table from your buffing wheel and smack you in the mouth. It's not worth it. Okay. But always be trying to lean in. Hello, Nick Pratt. Always be trying to lean into the pace at which you work in the shop. Trying to get a little more speed out. Try to increase the tempo a little bit. Um, Appreciate the share. Hello, Rick Lague or Lagu. Not sure how you pronounce that name. Thank you for stopping in. Um, I just said bump at the table. Oh yeah, music metronomes. This is a classic thing that music teachers everywhere go crazy about with students. Music students always make the mistake of starting to do something and then immediately trying to do it too fast, without actually establishing the proficiency. They just try to go fast. And what happens is they go fast and the wheels fall off. The whole thing crashes and burns. A metronome is a device for disciplining that desire to go fast. And what you do with a metronome is you play a passage. If you're a violinist, I'm a violinist, violist. You play a passage. If you make a mistake, the metronome goes, you, you set the metronome slower. You play it again. If you make a mistake, it goes a chunk slower. You keep bumping it down until you can play the passage without any problems. You have time to think through everything. Every fingering, every bow change, every shift, listening for intonation, making sure everything is coming out clean. When you can get it over and over clean, you bump the speed up a notch or two, just a couple clicks, and you play it again. And you keep establishing a new benchmark of consistent proficiency at the new speed before you try to bump it up. And if you ever move too fast and you bump it up and you start making mistakes, you bump it back down. And so this could be as simple uh, as you occasionally actually running some parts of your process on a timer. I know I've talked before about not being obsessed about running a timer on individual holsters, but can being concerned more about what the overall schedule is for completing a batch of work, whatever, you, whatever batch size you like to work in. And I still think that that's an important piece because there's always additional slop and slack time and work in the shop that doesn't factor into a completely focused one time start to finish single holster. Um, so be realistic. It's like the person who schedules things with no buffer time in between throughout the day, not even taking into consideration the time it will take to walk from one place to the other or take a bathroom break between meetings, that kind of thing. Don't schedule block to block to block to block to block. You have to leave some room in. And if you leave that room in, you have the ability to change gears, reset, take a breather, revamp, you know, and then hustle again. If you don't take those breaks, if you don't schedule them in, you end up gradually drowning or gradually suffocating throughout the day. If you set... I, I find the easiest way for me to have problems in my business, to have a difficult, frustrating day, is for me to stupidly over, um, overcommit myself. Scott Jenkins says, stat analysis will always be better with larger quantities. Yeah, as you average out over five units versus 500 versus 5,000 units, um, you get a more realistic picture. You have good days and bad days. You have slow days and fast days. 
Some days, like um, I threw a bunch of APL holsters away this week. I mean, not a ton, but I had made a new CNC fixture. I had redone some of the cam. I made a mistake. I didn't catch it. I had my employee make a bunch of shells, and I trimmed them, and they were wrong. And what I didn't do, and this is one of the other things that goes with speed, okay? Trust but verify your process, okay? If I have a new mold, brand new mold, just prototyped it, I'm going to make two or three shells off it at most. I'm not going to go like, okay, the mold's done. Make 100 holsters because I may find out as I've just finished pressing the 100th holster that there was some obvious stupid thing that I forgot to do and then all that material and all that labor is all scrap before you know before it even got halfway finished it's toast and so trust but verify your process uh, if you're building yourself a new trim jig and you think you got it done trim to finish them out fold them up make sure everything's kosher all the way to the end then go back and punch your batch don't get ahead of yourself rushing impatience in the process will always bite you. It might not bite you immediately, but it will always bite you. And if you catch yourself saying, I haven't properly vetted this process, I didn't, I haven't confirmed this is gonna work, oh, forget it, just do them all anyway. If you do that and you get bit, you have earned every bit of it. Every ounce of that, pain and stress, frustration, you earned all of it. Viper Kydex, I haven't even recently made a ton of holsters before realizing my mold was out of spec. Anytime you get a new mold, anytime, you never put it straight into production. Doesn't matter who made it. I made it, I make mistakes. I have sent out molds where the customers calling back and said, hey, something's not right here. And I had, I had made a holster shell and I hadn't noticed the problem. It happens. It's trite, but haste makes waste is absolutely true, says John Hoffman. That's true. And this is why I think I'm going to go back to form, uh, to, to foam, because I want to sort of slow down my process. I want to use the smallest possible pieces of plastic. I want to have every holster be a unique. Sn what am I talking about? Unique snowflake? No. Okay. Haste makes waste is true, and certain kinds of efficiency do involve wasting more material. But we've gone around and around that before in many different live broadcasts. So I'm not going to rehash it all here, except to say, if you are totally focused on not wasting time and are unwilling to consider trading material for time, you're probably missing potential efficiencies. Make 10, assemble 5, measure the rest, says Scott Jenkins. That's probably a very good benchmark. I tend to go a slightly, a slightly smaller quantity. Anytime I'm testing a mold, I'll usually make 3. And then... I'll finish two so that I have, you know, I have two to compare so that if, if I screw up the finishing out somehow, mess up the full, something goes wrong, that I have a second finished one to compare it to. And then if I notice any issues, I've got a third one that's not finished, that's not folded, that I can really examine and look at inside and out and then compare to the mold and think it through. Um, so three is my sweet number for testing things out. Make three, finish two, leave one unfinished, compare the finished ones, compare to the unfinished one, check, make adjustments, and then if everything th seems good, then I'll make a handful more, maybe five or ten, and punch those ones in. PJ saying no. I don't know if comments are lagging or what. Are you guys saying no over my uh, intent to return to foam production? Yeah, it's not quite April 1st. We'll see. We shall see. Um, so don't be in too much of a hurry. Don't rush and waste material. Don't rush and waste time. Think things through. Paul Morgan says, what quality process do you put in place and how many quality checks should there be? Uh, Paul, here's my basic quality control approach. Um, Obviously, before I put any mold into production, I make test shells and verify the mold. I verify the fit. I verify that there's no slop that's objectionable. I verify that I have full clearance around the trigger guard. I verify that my cut lines 
give clearance for a full firing grip. I verify that all the features I built into the holster function as I intended them to before I put the mold into production. Then, when an individual retail or wholesale unit is going through production, there are a couple checks. Uh, the first one is everything gets visually inspected after it gets formed. If for any reason, you know, on a swift press, maybe you had a bad laydown and you didn't quite get even distribution of your plastic around the edges, so maybe you didn't get a full 100% vacuum. Maybe your gauge didn't quite top out and you're not sure if the product is good. So anytime that I have marginal product that got formed where it's like, well, that's not quite all the way there, usually I'll set it aside for testing later or I will leave it as a training holster for my employee to practice on. Practice folding, practice pre-cutting, practice buffing, those kind of things. Um, or if I'm getting ready to run a new batch, if, I have them, if I've gone through the first three and quality controls have gone well, I'll have the employee make five or ten, and then I'll pick whichever ones came out least well from that initial batch and use those to test my CNC trim tool paths, to play around with folding, to do... I basically just... I use them up as beaters in the process to make sure that I'm getting something for the labor and material that went into them. When we're going to do a retail unit, it gets inspected after forming, then, when it's been trimmed and the rough edge finishing has been done on the top and bottom edges, some places you can't easily reach once the holder's fold, holster is folded, then it gets a look over then. I'm checking for corners or edges that got improperly uh, overbuffed or corners that got rounded off, things where um, the work has been too aggressive and is cut inside the lines I want. And I'll pick some out and verify them against a blue gun or a real gun to make sure the cut lines around the trigger guard are still where they're supposed to be and we've got the coverage we need. That's a quick check. And then, after they've been folded, before eyelets get put in, we just give a quick test fit on a couple to make sure things are lining up the way we expect. Uh, to make sure that we don't need to change anything about the folding drone, just verifying that the laser tape on there are right, that the sight channels are looking clean, that things are looking the way we're expecting, and that the holes post-fold are lining up. Then when everything's all together, um, hardware, full assembly, everything, then before it gets packaged, every single holster gets fit with, a, with a, an actual firearm, real steel. Uh, I don't do any final quality control checks with drones or molds of any kind, always the real gun. So that's my quality control process. Uh, currently, zero holsters leave the shop without me handling them and verifying them. We'll get to a point, after my employee's got a little more time under his belt. Hello, Levi. We'll get to a point where my employee will be responsible for final QC on some products, but we're not there yet. It's still early for him. Real steel check every holster. Yes, I know some companies don't, Jeff Quant, and when you get into higher volumes, um, you know, maybe you don't anymore. Maybe you check every, you know, one out of every 10. As you, as you get, except when you're on your honeymoon, doofus, when you get to a point where you have enough volume and the process is consistent enough and dialed enough, yeah, I don't care about making Levi's head explode. Oh, well. Um, when you get to the point where the process is really dialed, then the frequency with which you do quality control checks can be reduced commensurate to how reliable the process actually is. You know, if you make a batch of 500 holsters and every single one is dead on, you're going to loan me some guns? No, Levi, I'm not. You're going to be a big boy and buy your own. Um, I don't think that you have to absolutely test fit every single one. I don't think that's a set in stone requirement. I think for most small businesses, it's a wise move and it covers your butt. And it also gives you confidence when you're dealing with customers who are being, uh, difficult. Um, Yeah, Cody, it was only humor from my end, too. But no, seriously, Levi, I'm not going to loan you any guns. Um, if you have a customer call you back and say, hey, man, this holster doesn't fit, 
No, baby steps, absolutely. Have goals, work toward them, pick which guns you want to add next, and make holsters to save up money aggressively until you have the funds to buy real steel, and only launch a new model once you've got the money to buy real steel to support it. That's my, me that's, that's my method. I don't offer anything I don't have real steel for, and when I want to offer a new model, step one is real steel, always. Um, but if you have a customer, you know, email you back and say, man, this holster fits terribly. You know, the gun is super loose, it just falls out. And you test fit that holster because you test fit every holster with real steel and you know it was solid, then that gives you some baseline to work from in understanding your customer's expectations and why they might be experiencing the issue confidence that I know every holster is good to go when it leaves our shop. Yeah, that confidence and peace of mind is a big deal. In the old days, when we were all working just from blue guns, hello, Aaron Brass from BSD. Hi, Taylor Bailey. In the old days, when we were working just from blue guns, there were some times when you would literally ship off a holster and then say to yourself as you watched it leave, I hope I never hear from this person again. I hope hope I never hear from this person again. Just because, like, you didn't know if the holster was good or not. And you made it, and you shipped it, and you hope, and you hope. We don't want to be there anymore. That's not where I want to be. Uh, and if you're, if you're wanting to be in business and not just a hobby, and if your hobby is that stressful, it's not a good hobby. Um, if you want to be in business, that's not a place you want to be in your business either. So, um, the other thing about tempo is some people like fast paced and some people don't. And if you're a person who doesn't like and doesn't work well in a fast paced environment, then you need to find other ways to, to get the efficiency you need to run the business profitably. Uh, I tend to be kind of a fast paced person. I'm from New York. I like to talk fast. I like to move quick. I like to run around. I like moving at that, at that kind of speed. Not everybody does. And it's not the case that you have to do it my way or that you need to do it the way anybody else in particular does it. You need to do it the way that works best for you. But it does also mean that you have to recognize where your own comfort zone is in terms of pace and tempo and be willing to push yourself on it. Because... If you're actually putting in good work, you should be increasing in your ability to speed up. A few guys have joined since I last said this. I'm giving away a big sticker and one of my Morpheus Solo cigar trays. So if you'd like a cigar tray, share the feed and I will enter you into the drawing. Mike Hallam has a good plan there. I have, I have a local gun store that I'm good friends with that I have often gone to, although I don't do it anymore. I used to when I was still making stuff. Uh, I'm from Rochester, Mr. Lax. I'm from Rochester, New York. Actually, a little town outside it, but nobody's ever heard of Holcomb or East Bloomfield. Um, I'm from East Bloomfield, New York. Um, so when I was still making stuff that I did not, or like even things like, you know, I might make a holster for a gun that had a thumb safety, like MMPs. I had the non-thumb safety version. So I had blocking and I had marks on my gun. But sometimes, just to be sure, if I was going into town anyway, I'd stop in with some holsters and test fit on an MMP at the gun store that, um, that did actually have the thumb safety on, just so I could be completely certain that those were good to go. Um, and you're never going to be able to please everyone. Obviously, in theory, you know this. If you're in business, you've experienced this. Some people, you were from Jamestown, John Keller. I had cousins in Jamestown. My mom's whole family was from Dunkirk and Fredonia. So I spent a lot of time traveling back and forth through Buffalo and, uh, Buffalo and Silver Creek. Uh, but my aunt and my cousins lived in Jamestown for a long, long time. I've also got family in Erie. So the Rochester, Buffalo, Dunkirk, Erie corridor. Got a lot of family there. Hello, Tony Katner. 
Hello, Mr. Rasmussen. Um, you can't please everybody, and so even if you have good quality control, even if you work quickly and you deliver products on time, um, you're still going to have some customers who are unhappy. That's just life. You just deal with it. Um, if you don't work quickly, though, the, the flip side, if you work quickly, you may run into QC issues if you go too fast. If you are too meticulous, if you are too picky, if you can never let go of any small detail and say, shipping beats perfection, it's good enough, it's going out. If you can never do that, if you can't break out of that internal cycle, um, then you end up suffering on stress and slow delivery. Your customer um, would probably rather have a 95% perfect holster in a week than a 99% perfect holster in two weeks. Honey Oi Falls and Avon. My goodness, these people are all in my backyard. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in and around Honey Oi Falls. It's a cool little town. The falls in Honey Oi Falls are gorgeous. Especially around this time when the spring starts and the snow's melting and the falls are raging. Honey Oi Falls is really, really pretty. Um, so I always prefer to err on the side of going faster, heading off those QC potential issues at the pass by having a consistent quality control check that I always do, that I don't skip. How do you recognize potential from your employees? What do you expect from them? Paul, there are different kinds of employees, and it depends what position your business is in and what you're trying to turn it into. So um, if you have a business that's big enough to sustain a range of employees, each with a specialized area, then I'd look for two things. First, obviously, competence in the area I'm hiring them for. They have to have a certain basic raw skill set. And then an ability to learn and be taught and work well with others. Those two things are non-negotiable. Um, if a person isn't teachable, doesn't want to learn, isn't willing to receive instruction, uh, no, not at all. Mostly Irish. Um, If a person is not willing to receive instruction, then they're going to be a very difficult employee to have. Um, if you have a small business and you're looking at your first or second employee, neighbors are yelling, I don't know, um, then you need to look for somebody who has the ability to change gears, sustain a regular pace at different kinds of jobs, um, hmm. neighbors are kind of upset. Excuse me one second, guys. I'll be right back. No, not going to get gangster. It, it was sounding like I was hearing a car revving and then dying, and I was just, uh... Nosy neighbors? No, a little bit noisy. There was an argument, and then somebody's... It looks like somebody's car is broken down next door. So... It was just hard to hear. There was, there was some hubbub I was hearing through the wall. Um, it did indeed get suspenseful. I just stuck my head out the door of the shop to make sure everything was cool. Cool enough. Country living. It's nice and quiet out here. There's not a lot of other street noise around, so if anything loud happens, people are revving engines and things, it, the noise carries. You hear what's going on. Um, so uh, you can't please everybody. 
Oh, we were talking about employees. That's what it was. Um, I decided to make my first employee a skilled hire. That I was not interested uh, in looking for somebody who was going to come in with few skills and need a lot of training. I was interested in hiring somebody who already had a lot of the basic skills and would only need to be trained in the details and specifics of how we make this particular product. So I hired a guy who I had worked with for four years already in another shop uh, where he had helped to manage 15 or so other people. So I knew he was safe around tools. I knew he had good attention to detail. I knew I worked well with him because we've been good friends. Excuse me. We've been good friends uh, since 2003. Uh, and so I decided to go big or go home on my first employee because I wanted somebody who I was not going to have to babysit. Somebody who I could give discrete jobs to, explain how I want them done and what the end goal is, and then turn them loose and get finished product, which I've been able to do so far, which has been incredible. Eric has been doing fantastic work in the shop. I am super um, super pleased with how it's working. Uh, Mr. Lax, carry laws in New York State are abysmal. I'm really glad I'm not there anymore. I moved away when I was 18 and have not lived in New York since. Uh, I love living in a relatively free state in Indiana. Uh, it's nice to have my lifetime license to carry a handgun, to have no restrictions on concealed versus open carry, to not have to register any firearms, to have suppressors be legal. Um, a lot of things to like about Indiana. A lot of things to not like about New York. New, York, New York's gun laws are pretty horrible. Hello, Chris Johnson. Um, so when you are looking at the overall big picture, no SBS. Yes, Jimmy Rasliff, that's one of the only things I don't like about the gun laws in Indiana. There are no short barrel shotguns. But I'm not really a shotgun guy. So... You know, I'm in, I'm near Bloomington. I'm south of Indianapolis. My wife goes this weekend to get her CHL. Your sister's in Bloomington. Yeah, that's literally in my backyard. I'm in Bloomington. So I'm actually just across the county line outside Monroe County in Owen County uh, in Salisbury, Indiana. And so when you think about the big picture for your business and you're setting the tempo for how you want to build your business, you can either be trying to sort of balance the pace. So a classic example would be if you're a holster maker and you have a full-time day job and you're working nights and weekends in the shop and you're trying to find that sweet spot between um, being able to put in enough time to service your orders in a reasonable period of time and keep your customers happy, but you also aren't ready yet to slam the gas pedal down and go full time. It might be because you don't have the space or because you like your day job or, or for now the money's good and you want to stick around and you know, build up some cash reserves. There may be a, a variety of reasons for you know, basically riding the gas and the brake at the same time. But at a certain point, if you have a business, have a business. If you're not going to let it grow, if you're not going to make it grow, then you're constantly going to be dealing with that tension of trying to stunt its growth and prevent it from becoming something more. If you decide that you're going to go for it, then the tempo becomes really important because growing too quickly kills a lot of small businesses. They get overcommitted, demand increases, production can't keep up, they start missing. Jim Cunning, your dad's from Linton? That's awesome. Um, yeah, John, that's, that's a perfectly reasonable decision to make. You know you. You know what makes you tick. If you have a day job that you love, that pays the bills, that if you're happy, fantastic. 
if you have a business that you're building and you want to be in it full time, you have to be um, you have to be setting goals and picking up the pace so that when the time comes to grab the train, you're moving at the same speed and you don't get your arm yanked off. Because you really don't want to get yanked at that point. You want to be as, you know, this is like the transition period between, um, we do have open carry in Indiana. An Indiana carry, an Indiana license to carry handgun, what we call an LTCH, uh, authorizes the uh, possessor of the license to carry a handgun. It makes no statement about mode of carry. So you can, Todd Mays having trouble keeping up running solo for two weeks. Yeah. In Indiana, you can open carry or conceal carry. It's totally on you. There are no, uh, there's no brandishing in Indiana. So having your gun visible isn't considered uh, a threat, although you could, you know, you could threaten somebody. Um, in some states where it's required that you conceal, if the firearm is seen, that can get you into trouble, but not in Indiana. Paul Morgan, first thing I would do is tell myself the market is not saturated. Tell myself that there are thousands and thousands of gun owners in your state who have never even heard of Kydex, let alone seen a good Kydex holster. The market is out there. You need to figure out how to reach those people. That's it. Working around 80 hours a week to keep the day job satisfied and the holsters made on top of 10 hours of commuting a week. Yeah, 80 hours a week sounds about right. I'm probably working between 70 and 80 now. I don't. I don't keep that careful track of my own hours. Probably should. One of those things I'm not good at. Um, that connects back to the previous comment about employees I wanted to touch back on just for a second. If there are things in your business that you are not good at, you should try to outsource them. You can either hire somebody as a contractor to do them for you, uh, payroll, bookkeeping, you know, whatever it is. Uh, maybe it's your website design and updating the website. Whatever you're not good at, you can burn an enormous amount of energy and time and brain power trying to correct your deficiencies, trying to learn the things you're not good at, or you can focus your time and energy on the things you are good at, maximize your impact there, and then pay somebody else to do the things that are not naturally uh, in your wheelhouse. Like, if I had to do all my own bookkeeping, I'd probably close the business. Because that stuff is kryptonite to me. I can't handle it. It sucks the life out of me. P&L statements, I die. I just die. If I had to do my own taxes anymore for the business, it wouldn't be worth it for me. I would just, I'd probably be done. I'd find something else to do. Um, I hate that paperwork that much. And so recognizing where you're strong and where you're weak and rather than spending all that time trying to compensate for where you're weak, find somebody else to do that for you. If you have somebody who really, really likes getting in a groove and doing long days of pretty simple, repetitive kinds of tasks, teach that person to buff edges and assemble holsters, pay them well, and then you focus on the things you're good at. Might be marketing, might be prototyping, social media, doing videos, going and networking, cold calling, introducing yourself to gun store owners, going to training classes and hawking, whatever it is. If you're good at it, do that, rather than trying to find ways to make yourself good in areas where you don't have natural strengths. So know yourself and surround yourself with people who complement you in such a way that they make up for your deficiencies. You have to know the strengths and weaknesses of every, every employee. You have to know the strength, strengths and weaknesses of every employee. Yes, that's true. And consciously choose people who fill a niche, who fill in a gap that's missing in your business. I expect my next employee, my second employee, to be very different from my first employee. Not only because he's incredibly unique, which he is, but because I'm not going to be looking for the same thing twice. I'm going to be looking for a different kind of thing. Yeah, Skylar, that's, 
I'm very heavily influenced by Gary Vee on that stuff. And it has changed the way that I prioritize my expenditure of energy and time and attention in my business. Hello, Ahmad. I'm doing a giveaway. Big sticker and a Morpheus solo tray. Share the feed to be entered. Um, and thank you for stopping in, Ahmad. I don't want to waste my time doing things I find difficult because I'm not good at them. I, like, one way that I deal with stress in the business, if I'm having a hard day, if I'm beating my head against something that's not going well, I will take some time away from that and do something else that is kind of more gravy. Like, there really is something to be said for the confidence and energy boost that comes from a relatively easy victory in the shop. Like, man, this new mold is just kicking my butt. I'm going to go ahead and make 20 Glock 19 holsters. I'm going to take the rest of the afternoon, and I'm just going to make Glock 19 holsters, and then I'm going to clean the shop, and I'm going to answer some emails. I'm going to send some invoices. I'm going to reorder some supplies. I'm going to shift gears, and I'm just going to do things that I can get done. So at the end of the day, I'm not left with nothing in my hands for the time I put in in the day. And I also find that if I front load more difficult work, Toward the beginning of the day, I am able to deal with setbacks with more equanimity, which is big for me. Um, I, we currently open the shop at 8 and work straight through to 6.30, usually with a short break for lunch. And then I have dinner with my family and then come back out into the shop. Uh, the kids go to bed around 8 or a little after. I come back out to the shop and then usually work till midnight or so. Maybe a little laughter, depending on what I'm working on. Um, that time at the end of the day is usually not good grind, hustle, charge through stuff. Um, thank you, Keith Willis. I appreciate that. Um, so know how you work. Some people are morning people. Some people are evening people. Sometimes I'll really just like, my brain will start firing at 10 o'clock at night. And I'll have all kinds of ideas. And, I'll, and I'll, be, I'll set aside whatever I was working on on the mill. I'll sit down on my computer. I'll design something new. I'll machine a prototype. And I'll just be bombing around the shop at 11, then midnight, and then 1, and then 2, and still going at it because for some reason, I just caught a third win that day, and I've got all the energy. I don't have a way to control that. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I just hit a wall around 11 o'clock at night and okay. I'm going to knock off an hour early and go to bed because I just don't have it tonight. Um, but I find that giving myself a mix of some easy victories, some things that I can come out into the shop first thing and just crank them out and then also get right into the most challenging stuff I have for that day so that I'm well rested, so I've got time to overcome setbacks, I've got time to sit and think, I've got time to work well without feeling stressed. If I have something that has to go out by the end of the day, the earlier in the day I start it, the better work I do on it, without exception. Um, that doesn't always mean that I do it in the least possible amount of time. Like If I have something that has to ship by 5 and I don't have a chance to start on it till 3, I might still get it done. Yeah, John, it might be biorhythms. It might just be you know, sleep schedule. And it's also just, uh, for me, evening time is when I typically don't get bugged as much on my phone. And I think that's sort of a factor I hadn't really examined carefully to figure out why I sometimes hit a really good productive stride late in the evening. It's because I have uninterrupted time. And I'm trying to replicate that time in chunks during the day by just shutting things off turning off the phone um, so that for an hour or two I can simulate that, you know, in the zone, no distractions, late night time. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The other thing is that late night time I'm alone in my shop. My employee isn't here. And while I love working with him, there is a sense in which having him in the shop always divides my attention. That's just the reality. 
having a second person that I'm responsible for whose work I have to keep an eye on and make sure to teach him new things and explain. I'm drinking tea, Aaron. Or, yeah, Aaron Lax. Just, just mint tea. Um, and so my undivided attention, my uninterrupted time in the evening sometimes allows me to work at a tempo, at a pace, that I'm not able to achieve virtually any other time. Saturdays are also good for this. I'll turn the phone off, my employee is not in on Saturdays, and I can just crank on stuff. But sometimes Saturdays mean I have additional obligations outside the shop, things I have to do that take me away. I don't know what you guys are laughing at. I like mint tea. What can I say? Um, so that's pretty much it. I'm going to wrap it up now. I got some more mold prototyping to do this evening. Seems to be kind of a constant. And uh, if you haven't, if you're here and watching, oh, you guys think I'm drinking. Yeah, I know it's Everclear. Yeah, for sure. That's why I keep adding hot water to it. How does the wife deal? Uh, Dean, it's a constant challenge. We have to make sure to communicate well, and I have to be available to her when she needs me. Um, Uh, that's actually an interesting question that could probably be its whole own separate holster life topic, which could be um, interesting. Every single married couple is different. You know yourself and your wife. You have to do what works. Rocking and wobbling with CNC forms. Dan Taylor, if you're talking about the SIG 320 form, Understand it's a Unity 250-320 mold. That decision to make it multi-model induces that slop. You can work around it, but you sacrifice the multi-model nature of the mold. And if you want it to be perfectly set up for all the stuff that you want the holster to have and you really want it optimized, then buy custom. Um, but because my shop is by my house, I am able to, if I need to, take time away from the shop during the day, if I have to, and spend time with my family. If somebody's sick, if somebody gets hurt, something comes up, uh, I'm not hours away, I'm a minute away, which is great. Um, but depending on how you and your wife communicate, what else she has on her plate, like we've, got small, we've got four small kids. Um, my wife has got a more than full-time job all the time. And I can't take for granted that she's just going to run that all the time by herself. It would be tempting to take that for granted and say, yeah, you just, just handle all that stuff and let me work. But I'm my kid's dad. I have to be their dad. I need to love them. I need to spend time with them. I need to discipline them. They need all that stuff from me. My wife isn't a substitute for me. Um, she's a compliment to me, but not a substitute for me. The kids need both of us. Um, but also, it's been a big help over the past year. Uh, going full-time was a huge help for me and my wife because while I was still teaching full-time and working in the holster company part-time, it was I was away from the house more often I'm 32, Mr. Lax. I was away from the house more often, and there was much more abrupt shifting of gears. I'd come home from school. I'd open up the shop late in the afternoon. I was always wanting to work through dinner because I'd only had the shop open for a couple of hours. And being in the business full time and opening the shop first thing in the morning and working all day. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're not going to find me there. Um, has made us able, my wife and I both able to deal with the amount of time I put in with more good humor, with less, um, with less stress. But the other part of it is 
communicating with my wife about what's going on in the business. Um, yeah, my, uh, my oldest son turns five tomorrow. It's going to be fun. Have a little party. Maybe wake him up and shake him around a little bit. Um, it's not your birthday if you don't get a rude awakening. Um, but it helps my wife tremendously for me to communicate to her what's going on in the business, what I'm excited about, what's going well, what I'm working on next, uh, who I'm talking to, you know, who my clients are. It, having that information, even though I know she doesn't understand all of it in the same way I understand it, and that many of the details don't make sense to her because she isn't a holster maker and isn't in the business all the time like I am, that first of all, showing her the respect and care to actually take the time to communicate it to her itself is major, but also making sure she's on the same page about what I'm working on, what's coming next, what's going well. That helps her both to uh, be a real help to me when the work is difficult and I'm discouraged, and it also is a blessing for us to be able to celebrate victories together. When things are going well, and she find, and I tell her about it, that encourages both of us um, and helps helps both of us do our part of what my family our family needs. Levi, that's your wife, man. You married her, you've got to make that work, and you've got to do right by her. Um, Hello, Mike Telichik. You got in at the last minute. If you share the feed, you can be entered for this sweet big sticker or this sweet Morpheus solo tray. But I'm about to get off here. So if you're going to share the feed, you better share it right now. Um, but Levi, you need to have that discussion with your wife. Um, you are responsible for your family. And I'm a husband. I'm a father. That is more important than any business work that I do. If I had to walk away from this business, I would do it in a heartbeat if the alternative meant losing my family. No question. Totally gone. Okay? And so perspective is a big deal here. You guys see me in a business context. I'm talking about business stuff. But in the, in the calculation between my wife and my four kids, and my business, I would walk out on all of this and would find something else to do for the rest of my life if I had to, if the alternative was losing my family. And so, you know, everything there is balanced against that overriding calculus, which is my family is more important than my business. However, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to try to do both well. Because very rarely do you have a situation where it has to be all one or all the other. But it is easy, as a man, for me to prefer to pour my time and pour my energy and my attention into this because I see immediate results from this. When I design a mold and I machine it and I make a test holster and it fits beautifully, that's done. I'm holding the product in my hand. Being a dad and teaching my sons seemingly the same lessons over and over and over and over is in a lot of ways more difficult. It's a much longer game. Like, I'm doing work in the business for what's going to happen next month. I'm loving my sons and my daughter and teaching them for what's going to happen 10, 20, 40 years from now. I mean, my kids are going to be in the world a lot longer than any holster that I make. And if I don't keep those priorities straight, I'm an idiot. My wife does it pretty well. Balancing shop and marketing time is challenging. I always end up doing marketing after working all day in the shop, says Dean. Yeah, you know, one thing that I've reminded my wife of consistently is that I'm in a certain distinct part of the life of my business right now, which is that even though I started making holster, in 2008, my business is still in its infancy. Um, and what that means is 
my business does not have momentum yet. If I take a week off, the shop shuts down. My employee is not uh, self-sufficient without me here. And so I don't have the ability to stop pushing that wheel because if I stop, it stops. But the goal of pushing so hard so much now is to get to the point where the business has the momentum and I can, I don't know, do something like take a vacation with my family. Because currently I don't really do that. Um, it's not that I never take vacations, but if I'm on a vacation, the pressure is always on me. Jimmy Ratliff, awesome, 32 years, well done. I hope the next 32 are even better. Um, if I take a vacation, the pressure's on me because nothing's happening in the business while I'm gone. And I am really excited to see what I'm going to be able to do with my sons and my daughter in the shop. My oldest is six, going about to be seven. And so my kids are going to grow up working in this shop. That's awesome. I grew up doing work in my dad's shop, although he was not working in his shop nearly to the level that I'm working in mine. Um, and I'm really excited. But... I'm going to be investing more and more and more of my life into my kids, much more than I invest in my business because they matter more. They matter more to me and they matter more on an absolute level. People are more important than stuff, than things, than businesses, than tools, than products, than great customer reviews. My kids are more important and my wife is more important than all of that. So... We started off on tempo, we ended up on family stuff. Sometimes we get a little bit off topic, but I think that's probably a worthwhile discussion to have in more detail um, in, a, in a later episode. So I'll file that one away and pull it out sometime uh, when we can have a more, a more in-depth, um, intentional discussion about it. So I'm heading out right now. If you are watching and you have not yet shared the feed, you can still share it right now and be entered to win the big sticker or the Morpheus solo tray. So please share the feed. As usual, I will go back and I will read through all the comments. If I missed your question during the feed, I will try to answer it in text or I will roll over the question to another Facebook Live feed and try to answer it in the video then. Thank you very much, guys, for your time. As always, work hard. And... Uh, Keep paying it forward. Share the love around. Uh, anytime you have an opportunity to help another holster maker, uh, I encourage you to do it. I've been really pleased to see the ways in which the industry has opened up over the past two years, and I hope that it will continue to do so. And uh, the fact that you're here watching me, if you're a holster maker, means you're benefiting from me doing my best to pay it forward, and so I hope that you will do the same. Have a great night, guys. Take care.